Life Church. Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning and joining us. You know, it's hard to believe, but this is our seventh week of live streaming. Seven weeks, really? It's been that long since we've seen all you know, these wonderful people. We missed you all. We missed you so much. We miss getting together and having our times of worshiping together. And, you know, in many ways, it might be it's kind of nice sometimes doing the live streaming because we're at home. We can be in our comfy clothes or pajamas still. We can, you know, be snacking or eating as we're watching. You know, and so many of us, we, we turn on the live stream on our big TVs or our laptops or our iPads. And it's so easy to turn it on and to kind of get distracted and do other things because we're kings and queens of multitasking. You know, we're folding the laundry or we're doing this and that. And, you know, we're not giving our whole focus on the Lord. And I want to encourage you this morning to take the time to just be still. To worship, to just sit down and worship the Lord. Because He is worthy. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's our Restorer. He's our Provider. He's our Comforter. He is our ever-present help in times of trouble. He's the one who touches our heart when fear comes against us. He can bring us through anything that we face in this lifetime. He is more than enough. And I want to encourage you this morning to just... Just be still and worship him and let your hearts be prepared for the word that pastor brings and just not let the distractions of our homes pull us away from this time with him this morning. Amen. Let's worship this morning. Yes, 
best of job Cause all I have I'm worth I break it at your feet, Lord It's less than you deserve You're far more beautiful More precious than yours some of my desires and the fullness of my joy. I you spilled your blood, I spill my heart as an offering to my King. Here I am, take me as an
Good morning from New Life Church in Vansdale. Good to be with you this morning. God bless you. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We ask your presence, your anointing, your power, your peace to rest upon your people. Bless this time together. And we just pray that people will be touched today by the spirit of the Lord and by the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So good to be with you this morning. And first of all, I just want to say a word of thanks to Dave and Tammy Messenger and the time that they've been putting in on these live feed streams and for the time that they have edited and the singing and putting together, setting up equipment and all of that. Really deeply appreciate all that they have done and the hours that they have put in. And we just say a big thanks to them. This morning, as I begin, I would like to just review last week, we spoke concerning the signs of the time. And we talked a little bit about the vein of prophecy that God has given in the word of the Lord concerning the end times. We find that there are negative times and there are positive times that go on simultaneously in the end times. Some of the negative prophecies that are given concerning the end times is that there will be perilous times. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be pestilence and famines and storms and a shaking of the heaven and of the earth. These are some of the prophetic things that God spoke to us concerning the end times. Right along with that, there is a positive side because sometimes only the negative is seen by a lot of people. But there's a very positive thing that God says is going to happen in these end times. The prophet Joel started off and he said, in the last days, in the end times, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That was echoed by the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost as he preached concerning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, and he quotes from Joel uh, in chapter two, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, that's the younger generation, are going to be touched by the spirit of God. Not only the sons and daughters, but he said, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and I'm going to pour out my spirit upon the handmaidens and upon all flesh. And so we're thankful that while there is a shaking that goes on in the end times, there is also an outpouring of God's spirit. One of the minor prophets said that the glory of the latter house would far exceed that of the former. What is that saying? Very simply that God's glory and the pouring out of his spirit, the souls that are going to be saved, the lives that are going to be touched in this end time revival, is going to exceed far of anything that we have seen on the day of Pentecost or in the top of Solomon's temple. So we're excited about the times we're living in. And uh, we said, well, what is God saying in all of this? One of the things that we said, God is trying to get our attention as Christians, as believers, as the church. And he's beginning to shake us up and said, it's time to return to me. It's time to pray, to seek my face, to turn from your wicked ways and to cry out for revival because I want to come and touch your land. But it comes as God's people, the church, begin to pray and seek God and turn back to God. So one of the things I'd like to share with you this morning is also concerning end times. As the result of all that goes on in the last days, one of the things that happens is God says people's hearts are going to be fearful. The Gospel of Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 says, men's hearts will fail them for fear because of the things that are coming on the face of the earth. So we're living in a time right now where there is fear in our nation. There's fear in many people's hearts. And maybe you this morning, are being affected by fear. One of the things I've found about fear, fear drives people. Jesus leads people. And many people are driven by fear. Fear of this virus that they're going to catch and they're going to die. 
But people are fearful about losing their job, about not having enough money, about not having enough food. And yes, maybe not even having enough toilet paper. But all of these things cause fear in people's lives. People are fearful that, uh, they're, that they're not going to make it. I mean, they're, they're just fearful about what's happening. They look at the news and the news sparks fear. And so people are afraid they're going to catch what, they're, what the news media is talking about. They're going to get, and the, and the virus is serious. It, does, it, it affects the older people, particularly, and people that have pre-existing conditions. They say that in our nation that there are over uh, millions of people that have been affected and that there's 60 some thousand that have died. I don't know if those figures are right or wrong. They could be inflated and maybe they're inaccurate. But what is happening is there are a lot of people that are catching this thing. And we say, how do we handle the fear, the apprehension, the uncertainty of the time we're living in right now in the United States, and not only in the United States, but around the world. There are a lot of fears, that not just because of the virus, but I'm, 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 I'm really troubled sometimes, but the fears that are in Christians. People are constantly fearful of war. Sometimes they're fearful of dying. They're fearful of death. Fearful of the future, what is going to happen? They're fearful that they may not have enough of food. So they go out and buy cans and tons of food, which many times rots and gets old. People are not afraid that they may not have enough of money. People are afraid of storms. They're afraid of earthquakes. People are afraid sometimes of darkness. People are afraid of the rapture afraid of the second coming of Jesus Christ. When is it going to be? Am I going to be there when Jesus Christ comes? Afraid of the Antichrist. People are afraid of the great tribulation. They read about it. They read the book of Revelation and they shake with fear, not knowing how to rightly divide the word of God. So there are a lot of things that cause fear in people's lives. I'd like to address that this morning because I know some of you are probably grappling with fear in some area of your life. The word fear and the, and the subject of fear is mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. And God gives us two words that are mentioned over 63 times in the Bible. Those two times, two words are simply fear not. Those words were spoken by God. They were spoken by angels. Jesus spoke the words, fear not. They were given in visions, fear not Mary, uh, fear not Paul. And uh, many places in the Bible, over 63 times, God exhorts us, don't fear. Why so many times? Because fear is something that drives people. It affects them. And one of the problems with fear is mentioned in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. The problem with fear is it drives people, it, it affects people's, it affects their, their, their personality, it affects their, their plans because they're driven by fear. They don't want to go out in the dark. They don't want to meet some people because they're afraid maybe they're carrying the virus. Maybe uh, they're afraid of, of um, the job not coming back. They're maybe off of their job. They're afraid that job doesn't come back. Fear has torment. It torments homes. It torments marriages. It torments the old. It torments the young. I believe God's word very specifically says, fear not. Now, unbelievers, that's not going to affect them. But I believe for us who are Christians, God doesn't want you driven by fear. God wants you to be set free from fear. Fear that your child is going to fail. Fear that your loved one is going to die. Fear of being around strangers. Fear of talking about Jesus Christ. 
even fear of praying in public. There are a lot of people that are, are just very fearful in their lives. Listen to God's word in Psalms 23. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Very key words there. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and that simply de defines many times we go through things that are very serious, very scary, and very uncertain. God says here, even though we walk through these valleys, and even death, God says, I, and David is crying out, he says, I will fear no evil. This is the God's plan, is that you fear nothing as a believer, that God breaks that spirit of fear. And the, the thing that you're fearing, you know, what you think about in the negativity, and what if this, and I don't believe, and what, what if that happens, that has an effect on your life, on your decisions, and on how you live. There are people that are not happy because they're driven by fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And God says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Here's another key. When we recognize that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, God's desire and plan for your life is that he bless you and that he loves you and that he plans good for your life. And yet, in spite of what we read in the word, many times we have fear. God says the reason we have fear is that we don't recognize God's here with us. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. God's saying, I'm with you. When we recognize God's with you at your job, God's with you in your home, God's with you when you make your decision, all you need to do is call out to him. When you meet people, God's there with you, protecting, providing, and helping you in every way. So God says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So one of the things, Psalms 23 is such a precious Psalm, and I would encourage you to read it because as a good shepherd, because we have a good shepherd, which is Jesus Christ, he will not allow you to be eaten by the wolves, to be a failure, to die before your time. God hasn't given us that fear. Listen to Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded you, Joshua, to be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. Do not be fearful. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. One of the things that we've got to do is get these scriptures into our spirit because we recognize wherever you go and whatever you do, God's there with you. You're not alone. There are times that you go into scary situations. And I think that all of us in our life, we've been through some crises that really shook us up. We were not really sure we were going to come out of it alive. I think many people go through experiences. Sometimes fear is okay. It's for as like a child. They need to learn not to touch hot objects. But you see, as a believer, when we live in our lifestyle, God doesn't want you to be overcome with fear. That's not God's plan. That's not God's purpose. First, Second Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, fear doesn't come from God. It comes from the devil. It comes from the fact that we don't know the God that we serve. Psalms 34 and verse uh, four. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Look at that verse again. I sought the Lord. One of the ways that you overcome fear is seek God. Ask God to set you free from that spirit of fear. David said, I sought the Lord. What happens when you seek the Lord? He said, and he heard me. And what did he do? He said, he, God delivered me from all my fears. Let me ask you a question. 
Can God deliver us from fear or do we always have to live from fear? That scripture says, God, David says, he delivered me from fear. Now listen, if he delivered David from fear, that is a principle for all of us as believers. God wants to set you free from the fear of this virus, from the fear of failure, from the fear of the future. God wants to set you free, totally of fear. How can I be set free from fear? Listen to God's word. If therefore, John 8, 36, if therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. How does freedom from fear come? It comes from the son of God, Jesus Christ. You see, there's a pattern there in the life of Jesus. First of all, Jesus came to set us free from our sins. He came to forgive us of our sins. This is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, one of the things that fear does is it keeps you from having that everlasting and eternal life that Jesus came to give you. So <clears throat> Jesus said, uh, the, the Bible says, if therefore the Son shall make you free. Freedom from sin comes from Jesus. Freedom from Satan and all of his power and adversarial attacks on you. That freedom also comes from Jesus Christ. Freedom from sin, freedom from Satan, but also freedom from self and the world. And freedom from the things that are in the world. Galatians 5 talks about the, the works of the flesh and all that's in the world. Fear is part of the working of the old Adamic nature. It is there because we don't know God. We don't know the love of God. And God came to set us free from everything that comes to us in our life. Sin, Satan, self, the world, and even fear. Again, don't forget that scripture. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God wants you to have that freedom. So our freedom starts when we come to Jesus Christ. He frees us from sin. Then he frees us from the power of Satan and from that old Adamic nature of self and self-pity. God wants to set you free from your fears. And I know we're living in uncertain times. And I know that we're living in perilous times, but we're also living in times when God's spirit in these end times is being poured out. And I really am looking for a tremendous revival and an gathering of souls before Jesus comes. Because again, in the gospel, in the book of Acts chapter three, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. This was not written to heathen. This was written in the book of Acts to Christians. Jesus is saying, repent, be converted, be turned, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing, that's revival, that's the outpouring of God's spirit may come. And then after that outpouring, he said, and he will send Jesus Christ whom the heavens must hold until all things have been fulfilled, which were spoken by the prophets. So fear, fear is broken by Jesus Christ. It's broken by his love. There's a scripture that I want to read out of the Tyndall's Living Bible. And I like the way this is written. That's why I, I don't read Tyndall's Living Bible all over the time, but I like this verse, First John chapter four and verse 18. We need, we need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. We need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ loves you perfectly. He's there and to, to pour out his love. When you recognize someone loves you, you trust them. 
So God says, we need to have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us eliminates the dread of what might happen to us. If, you, if we are afraid, it is for fear that we, might not do, uh, that we might not succeed or that we might fail. And so God's love will never let you down. Trust God with your life. Trust that Jesus Christ will take you through and you will not fail. I look back in the Bible and I see some people who trusted God. I look at the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I says, you know what? They trusted God with their life. The king said, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. But they trusted God. They did not fear God. They had devotion to God. They loved God and they knew God loved them. And they said, because God loves us, he's able to keep us from the fire. We don't know if he will, but if not, we trust him. We're going to stand. We're not going to bow. God took them through. And I look at all the way through the Bible, people who trusted God. We've got to learn. The Bible says, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken. Don't live your life in fear. Let Jesus Christ, who came to free you from your sins, to free you from the power of Satan, to free you from self and the world, let him free you from your fears. You say, is that possible? All things are possible to them that believe. So this morning, I would like to conclude this time with remembering Jesus Christ. One of the things that he has done for all of us is God laid down the life of his son that we might have victory, forgiveness, and be an overcomer. God doesn't want you to be a failure. God doesn't want you to be driven by fear, but he wants you to be led by the Spirit, led by the Holy Ghost, led by the Word of God. And so I want to just take some time this morning and say, could we, could we just take this time as the family of God and remember God loves you. That love was expressed in the sacrifice of his son that you might be set free from fear, from torment, from all of the things that are driving you and making you negative and pulling you down. Jesus came to set you free. So in the book of Corinthians, God says, for this is what the Lord himself said. And I pass it on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread. And when he had uh, given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same time, he took the cup and he, uh, and he said, this cup, is, uh, the, this cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. This do in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Now, the bread is not the literal body of Jesus Christ. It is a picture of God's son, which was broken. His body suffered the breaking of the skin and the flowing of blood. So when Jesus, when God said in his word here, take this, this is my body. It's not literally the body of Jesus, but it is a picture, a type, an allegory of Jesus' suffering that was broken and shedding of his blood that you and I may be set free. I believe there is power in Jesus' name. And I believe as we take of the table of the Lord, two things are very significant. One of them is the forgiveness of sin. The second is the healing of your body. And even this morning, if you've messed up your life this week, as we take, God says, Take a little time and examine yourself to see where you are with God.
If you're running from God, this is the time before you take communion to come and wait before God and say, God, I'm tired of running. I'm coming back. I repent and I receive Jesus Christ. And so this morning, let's just take a moment and say, God, let your Holy Spirit search me. Where am I? Where is my life? Am I, am I out of line with you? Am I out of line with my brothers and sisters? If I am, I want you to talk to me. And when God talks to you, if he shows you something, repent. It doesn't take long. It just says, God, I want you to forgive me of my sin. I am a sinner. I've messed up this week. But I know you said when we sin, if we confess our sin, that you are faithful and you are just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So let's take the bread this morning. And as we break it, we want to say, Lord, I thank you for your body, which was broken, that my sins may be forgiven, that my past is forgiven, and my present is, is, is embellished and, and is flowing with your power and love. And my future is assured because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray that you will bless the bread. And as we wait for just a moment, I pray that you will speak to people about their life. If they've missed you, if they've sinned, if they've strayed from you, let this be a time of repentance where they will say, God, forgive me. I return to you. Now, Lord, if there are any that are sick this morning, I pray that as they take this in faith, I believe you're going to touch people and their bodies are going to be healed and restored. So in faith, we take of the bread in remembrance of the broken body of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and for the healing of our diseases. As a family, I pray that you take us together. Let's take of the bread. Thank you, Lord. Jesus took the cup, said, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you do this, remember, I will always forgive your sins. You say, but I've sinned so much. It's not how much you have sinned. It's how big a God is that will love you in spite of yourself. God came to love you, not condemn you. He hasn't come to bring the spirit of condemnation. He's come to bring life and that more abundantly. It comes through faith in him. It starts with him. He is the forgiver of your sins, the defeater of Satan, the overcomer of the flesh and of the world, and the one who delivers you from your fears. So I thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no release. There is no forgiveness of sin. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. God says, as we believe in Jesus Christ, there is remission of sins. And I thank God that wherever you are and whatever you have done, God will forgive you if you repent and come to him. Let's take in remembrance of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is victory in Jesus. I love the old song, there's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb. And there's an old song that called victory in Jesus. You see, God came to give you victory. He never designed you to live under a curse and under the burdens of the world. He came to set you free that you might have life and that more abundantly. In Jesus Christ, life begins. And as you walk with him and in his word and in his spirit, that life will continue. 
Trust him. Build a close relationship with him. God loves you. God bless you. Father, I pray that people will be healed today and that people will come back to you and repent of their sins and receive you as their savior and then allow the power of your Holy Spirit to quicken, strengthen, and anoint them as they live by day by day in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and God keep you and God use you to be an ambassador for him in this generation. Amen.